Oh, hi, Carrie. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> Everyone can hear me when I'm talking now. I just saying hi to Carrie, who's joining us tonight. Hello. Hi, Carrie, I can hear you. Oh, gosh, hi. Hi, yeah. Oh, brilliant, that's great. At least you managed to get the microphone to work. <laughs> it's always oh. the, the way, isn't it, when you start these things? It is. It's, uh, I'm sorry. it's echo echoing a bit at the minute. That's all right, don't worry, as long as we can hear <laughs> you. Perfect. Well, we'll give it another five minutes or so, and then we can yeah. start. Thank you. Okay.
Oh, it is working. <laughs> so I make sure that the video actually works. Oh, fab. And you are on there, Carrie. Did your video work, Carrie? Is it not working? Uh, no, unfortunately, it's, it's not working. Sorry. That's fine. No, don't worry. It's not a problem. I just wanted to have you on here to talk anyway, because it's just nice to get your opinion on some things. So um, <clears throat> I'll just start up with what's going to happen this evening and then I'll let Carrie just introduce herself as well. So I do recognise a few names on here. We actually we have a big number of sign ups tonight, nearly 200 people. But I think quite a lot of people are probably going to watch this in their own sort of time and um, because it is recorded as well so I'll send the recording to everybody even those of you that have seen it tonight I'll get that across to you tomorrow as well because it might just come handy in the future or you might want to share it with some friends that might find it useful and um, so I definitely recognize some of the names on here which is lovely and um, so I'm Sophie and I'm a vet and um, about I think it was a bit about a month ago now um, no, maybe not quite. I lost my dog Izzy to lung cancer. And the overwhelming response that I got from people was incredible. And I thought I'd like to give something back and, you know, to kind of broach a topic that I guess is a little bit taboo. Um, not many people speak about having a pet put sleep and maybe they feel that it's, you know, other people might not think it's important if they talk about it. I think that's possibly a, you know, a difficult um, topic for people to talk about. My partner certainly said, as soon as we put Izzy to sleep, people don't really understand because they think it's just a dog. And that was his very first kind of reaction um, when he was really upset. And I guess I said to him, you know, it's like anything in life, I guess. People don't, they, they appreciate your grief, but they don't always understand your journey. So um, tonight's session is going to be about sort of maybe things to look for when you feel the time is right, how to prepare yourself, and what to expect, because some of you may never have had a pet put sleep. And I think it's quite a, you know, unfortunately, not an experience you want to repeat too much, but it's quite a unique experience. And the fact that it's it's not something you face every day and you might not know what to expect. And you might want to have some things to, in place to be able to prepare yourself and then to deal with the situation after. So I'm going to hand over to Carrie and I'm just going to let her um, introduce herself. And she's kindly given her time this evening, which is, is amazing. Um, so I'll let you introduce yourself, Carrie. Hi, can everybody hear me OK? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Hi. Um, so first of all, thank you so much, Sophie, for asking me to join you tonight. Um, you. So, yeah, I'm a, an, an ex veterinary care assistant. I was uh, working in veterinary practice for about 16 years and I've been a pet bereavement counsellor for the last 20, 21 years. And in, so in that time, I've helped a lot of clients through pre and post loss of a companion animal. And the main reason I do this job is because, um, as I said, I think people just don't quite get how difficult it can be to lose or face losing a companion. So um, I'm happy to, you know, um, offer advice, tips, whatever I can do to help out tonight. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Carrie. No, and I'll definitely be calling on you to give your advice as we go along. And you're very welcome, everyone, to put any questions or anything in the chat box that you want to share. You might not want to share anything, you might just want to kind of take it all in as you go along. But if you do want to, then please do. And, and it's not a focus just around dogs. It's everything. You know, it doesn't matter the size of the pet or how long they've been in your life. I think any situation is a very difficult one. So I was just going to start with, I think, trying to think about when is the right time. And I think that's the bit that people always struggle with. And my little saying is always the bit at the bottom. It's better to be a day too early than a day too late. And I think it's incredibly true. And I know when I put Izzy to sleep, because I, I did that myself. I mean, I guess there's pros and cons to that um, being a vet, but the one thing I did do was start to make a note of the things that were changing. And my partner who he isn't veterinary related at all, he couldn't always notice those changes until I pointed them out. And I think that's what made the final decision really difficult because he couldn't see that he couldn't see that actually she had deteriorated um without it being sort of thrown at him 
And for me to step back and say, if I was working in clinic now and this was someone else's dog, I know exactly what I would be telling them to do. And that's what I had to do, almost had to take myself out of the situation. Um, so I think just making a list is a really useful thing, sitting down and thinking about all the things that your dog, cat, rabbit, guinea pig, doesn't matter, likes to do. Oh, I'm just getting a bit of feedback. Hang on a sec. Oh, might be on yours, Carrie. Oh, there, there it goes, that's now. So all the things that they like to do and all their normal behaviours, I think that's a really good place to start and really dig deep and think of, you know, the day-to-day -day activities that your pet does. All their favourite foods. Do they still want those favourite foods? I go back now when I think about um, another dog I had, Chops, and one of his favourite foods was chicken. And the day that he turned his nose up was a day that I thought, oh, my goodness, OK, that's a big deal. And he also, even though I'm not a great advocate now for throwing balls for dogs, but th this is a while ago that I had him, he loved a tennis ball. He'd go wild for a tennis ball. And again, he didn't want that. Um, and again, some dogs might shy away from attention. And that goes with, again, with, with cats. If they're usually quite cuddly and they decide, no, I'm just going to go away and hide. I'm going to, you know, take myself off. Then that's often a sign as well that they're really kind of struggling with how they're feeling. But of course, we know that animals will fight through anything. You know, they want to please you. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes to read that body language. But just making a note on a daily basis, you know, how each day is. It, how many good days? How many bad days? You know, are there more good days than bad days or are there more bad days? Um, and a, lot, a few other things I put on here, this is not obviously an inclusive list. Everyone will have a pet at home that has all different kinds of quirks and interests. But barking when someone arrives, sunbathing. So do you have a pet that really likes to sunbathe and suddenly is just hiding away somewhere? Obviously, I don't want them to sunbathe for too long in this heat, but you, you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Are they usually a hunter, like mainly for cats? And um, are they urinating and defecating in appropriate places or are they just doing it where they're lying or are they doing it in the house? Or if it was in um, an enclosure for rabbits and guinea pigs, are they doing it you know, on their bed? Which we know that a lot of animals aren't dirty like that. Um, I keep rats as well and they always go to the toilet in the same place. So, again, you know, looking at where where they're going and have they changed their habits? And again, do they still enjoy sleeping in their favourite spot or are they hiding out in the garden or taking themselves somewhere again? Like complete change of behaviour. And games, have they got certain games that they still enjoy? Are they, for dogs, obviously, especially, do they enjoy going for a walk or are they seeming like, actually, I'm not really interested? And is it that some days they are and some days they aren't, but now you're finding over the period of a week that you've noticed these changes that actually there's five days they're not interested and just two that they are. So it's, it's like balancing it. I think this is one of my most important parts. And this is, are they able to relax? Are they able to actually switch off, lie down and properly sleep? Or are they, you know, because they're uncomfortable or in pain, are they feeling like, you know, they just can't switch off, which is a big thing. You know, they need to be able to rest. And I think, you know, if you've got an animal that isn't able to, you know, something like a rabbit who's constantly grinding their teeth and, you know, really anxious, then it's a real sure sign that actually they're just not enjoying the time that they have. And are they showing any different types of behaviours like aggression? You know, is it that you're, you know, they're, they're lashing out or doing something they don't usually do? So it's a really important to look at those behaviours. And do they still want to take a treat and do they want to interact with the family, with other pets? This is such a simple list of things that I thought were kind of big things. But you might have little things like, your dog might sleep on your bed or your cat might sleep on your bed. In fact, your rabbit might sleep on your bed. My partner used to have a giant um, lop and he used to sleep on his bed. And is it that they don't want to do that? They don't want to, um, you know, be there anymore. They want to take themselves away. These new changes that you're noticing and you're thinking, oh, you know, this is not, this, this means that they're perhaps not enjoying life like they're used to. So I think you need to make that unique list <clears throat> and start to, cross things off or make notes when they change so that you know what's going on. Because when a pet's deteriorating, sometimes I think it's incredibly difficult to notice that. And you almost convince yourself that actually it's okay. Um, so Emily just um, said here that her foster dog keeps pacing around, crying and whining for the past three days, became aggressive towards um, your other dogs and her and his vets. He would usually hoover his food and he started to 
leave his food in a bowl and just kept going back to sleep. Yeah, and that's another thing as well. Dogs that are sleeping or any animal sleeping for a long period, you know, too long, is often that they're just feeling uncomfortable and painful and they just want to just, you know, lie there and, and not be interrupted. So um, again, this is like another list that you can make as well, looking at overt signs of pain. Um, that's really sad. So when he says, well, you used to chase, chase your dogs and cat and he doesn't care anymore. And I think they're all signs that when they start to almost change that behavior, mm. they've almost sort of had, had enough. And the thing is they will keep, you know, I think you've got to bear in mind that eating, it can't be the only thing that we go with here. There's many animals that will eat right up until their final days. And in fact, there's a weird scenario that happens in people that I see a lot in animals in clinic. And that's where they actually eat more um, towards the last few days. It's almost like a kind of preservation thing. And it might be they haven't eaten for maybe a few days or been really picky and all of a sudden they get a really ravenous appetite. And sometimes that's a sign that we're getting towards the end. And that's another thing that I notice sometimes in animals that are really unwell. Um, Isabel said she used to trim the nails of a 23 year old cat and her owner wanted to let her go as she, as she was incontinent and very shaky and not really able to eat. It was her granddaughter's cat. And so she felt unable to make the decision. That's really hard as well. when you haven't got the actual like official owner or person there. She asked me to talk to her granddaughter and describe the cat's life and ask her if she felt she still had quality of life. Once the granddaughter heard from me the reality of the cat's life, she made the hard decision to have her cat put to sleep and the vet came to the house. Yeah, and you know, I think that um, that's very important. You almost need someone from the outside, like a vet visit, vet nurse, animal care assistant, someone that's around animals regularly can sort of see from the outside their honest opinion of what they feel, because that's really hard to give that opinion. Yeah, definitely. My saying there as well, Courtney, it's definitely better to be a day too early than a day too late. Um, yeah, it is. It is. That's, I think it's, it's very, very true because you can, you know, I've seen in clinic where people have come in and they felt guilty because they feel like they should have done it last week, but they didn't do it last week just because they got that slight inch of hope that maybe there was that little bit of hope that maybe the miraculously get better or they were going to go on for another few weeks because you just don't know because it's not it's an un, it's a really odd decision to make we don't make it for people we don't you know we're we're making that a big decision but I think sometimes getting someone from the outside to be honest and to say to a friend can you be really honest like what do you think when you see him or her like what, what do you see and that might actually I don't know if you think that's a helpful thing Carrie in terms of making a decision yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah, yeah um trying to get someone that's not invested in that particular you know that still be you know friends still going to like your your pets but you know not someone that's with them every day yeah yeah um, um I, I, I'm, I'm so, I'm so, so sorry. sorry it's um it's, it's echoing echoing out. Out. I, miss, I missed, I missed the last well, it that, is echoing. Uh, echoing. hang on let's see if i can sort your echo hang on a sec sorry. don't worry can you if you speak now carriers and see if i can hear you hello yeah, that's it. That's fine. I've sorted that my end. That's okay. That's nice and clear. Yeah, I think sometimes because no, don't apologize. Please don't. Don't worry. It's a nice, relaxed e evening. I just really want people to share stories. And if anyone can take anything from this this evening, it would be really useful. So there's absolutely no pressure. Um, but I think it's that thing, isn't it? That when you're with, it's like when you're with a person, I know this is a really poor analogy, but similar thing, you know, I use this a lot with, with, with describing and saying, when you see someone every day and they lose weight, you don't really notice it. But when you haven't seen someone for a couple of weeks, you might really notice it. And I think sometimes that kind of external help will help you to sort of make that, that decision. Um, Oh, that's really sad. So Emily, yeah, well, Emily, of course, Emily, you've got lucky. So Emily's um, going through a really tough time at the moment because rescued a little dog, um, a street, was he, he, no, he was not a street dog. Well, he sort of kept like a street dog, but not. Um, and really quite badly abused. And she was very kind and um, has taken him on. Um, that's right, he was chained up. I remember that now. 
and in a really poor condition and she's been looking after him and he is sort of showing end of life but I know it's been complicated for you Emily because I believe if I've got this right you've been really held back by certain legal situations to be able to actually make that decision for him and um, I think I've got that story right um yes and you haven't been able to just do what you what you feel is best for him which is also awful as well I remember taking care of a little Westy um for somebody and thinking I really want to be able to like put this little dog to sleep like today like he looks absolutely terrible and um actually what they did was they cut their holiday short and they came back I spoke to him on the phone and said look he is really bad and I know you're saying he's having good and bad days but I would say most of his days are poor so it is it's a big it's a massive decision and I think you should take someone from the outside to help you and I've just put a few of the kind of signs of overt signs of pain that you again might not notice again my dog had very labored breathing heavy breathing and I had to make my partner sit there and watch this and say please look like it's really difficult for her to take a breath and when I pointed it out, he was like, I suppose it's just because her breathing has become worse over a period of time. He didn't realise how bad it was. And the other thing with her as well is that her pulse was so fast. So it's always good to know the rough pulse rate of your pet, because when they are in pain, that will go up and it will go up when they're stressed as well. So if they're feeling very stressed because they're not well. So just knowing the general signs of when an animal is unwell, you'll know whether actually the treatment they're on is perhaps isn't working. So make those lists, put them to one side, write notes for yourself. So you can almost keep like a little journal of what was going on over the few days leading up. So you can then make that decision thing. And it might be something you find useful to read back over in future in the future and think, just to, just to put it in your mind, yes, I definitely, I, I know I made the right decision. Because many people say that to me after they've had a pet put to sleep. I don't know if I've done the right thing. And uh, like I, I wouldn't put them to sleep if I didn't think they were doing the right thing. But it's nice you know, to have something there that you've written down to go back and to, to sort of look and to affirm the fact that you were right. Do you think anything like that would help, Carrie? Like that lead up, anything they can do to help themselves, you know, sort of... Yeah. I, I do. I think um, what came to mind was it's almost like having a having a baseline for your pet's norm, and then um, obviously if if any behaviours change and it's out of the norm for your pet, then it'd be easier to show show the vet as well uh, what has changed and when, and also if you're understandably upset and unable to express what's changed or what's going on you can, you can maybe show this journal or this diary of um events and there might be something in there that there's a pattern that you you can't see but the maybe the vet sees and thinks uh, that correlates to that and you know, yeah. together you can form a plan moving forwards yeah, I think it's a good idea because the other thing as well is that sometimes with when when animals go to the vets, I'm sure you've experienced this all of you at some stage, but they go to the vets and it's an instant like um, um, uh, fight or, or flight situation. So they get that adrenaline rush. You know that whole situation like when you go to the doctors and you suddenly think, I've had this before. I sit there and think, oh, my headache's gone, or you know, I sort of feel, because it's that anxiety and they feel that and often you know build up to that. And to the vet, they might look better than what they really are at home and that's the other thing you know your pet so if you feel that you know sometimes you might be faced in a situation and I know this happens in the veterinary industry a lot where the vet might be suggesting further treatment or maybe the option for surgery all these things that might have a really low chance of helping your pet but you might feel I don't want to do that and I think you have to explain that you have to bear in mind that some vets find the whole is saying to an owner I think you need to put your dog to sleep or your cat or your rabbit or you know whatever pet it is I think you need to do that unless they're overtly suffering and they're thinking oh my goodness you really need to they can sometimes find that quite tricky and I think that they might throw other options at you um because they might be trying to read you and think they're not ready yet maybe they could do this or do that 
Um, and so I think you need to be really honest and open and say, I've come here today because this is on my mind and this is what I think is probably going to be, you know, the best outcome. Um, and that will open up that conversation. And you, you almost need to be the one to do that. Um, I was going to read out some of the comments here, actually. Um, we lost our golden retriever a few weeks ago. I'm sorry, it's horrible. He just he just turned 11, epileptic, lived with us for six years. We were on our holidays. He was in kennels. We spoke regularly to the kennels. He'd had a couple of big fits and just wasn't recovering like he used to. Although I took it, although it took him a long time to recover over the last couple of months, we came back off the holidays and collected him ASAP. Realized it was time. We let him go later that day. He went off with a final meal. Oh, I know. That's our. Uh, that's. That's some of the things I'm going to actually go on about the scene and some of the plans that you can put in the, in place. And Natasha said, funny you should say about eating lots, I lost the most beautiful girl to rubber jaw as a result of renal failure, her pancreatitis too. She was doing really well, but started to become aggressive and grouchy, which isn't her. Took my baby to the vets due to age. She had no teeth, so could tell early signs, couldn't tell early signs of loose teeth. The vet told us and we said to let our baby go ASAP. She had put on weight and everything. We was we were devastated and our vet was gutted too. My deepest regret as I didn't let my girl go was I didn't let my girl go early as it must have been excruciating for her. I miss her so much as she was a special little soul. That's the thing, isn't it? It never leaves you. It's horrible, really. And but you're right. And you're always I think that's a natural behavior, isn't it? To almost blame yourself for the whole thing like should I have done it then should I not have done it should I you know I think that's probably normal human nature isn't it to be very questionable about your what you've chosen to do um, and Nina's put my girl is 14 years now blind has arthritis and on meds and pretty much deaf bless her two years ago the age generation started her sight first and over the two years she has become very slow with her movements she's stubborn and can't be guided but it's amazing to watch her track her steps and find her way Bless her. it's very clever it's amazing how they can lose senses isn't it animals and still you know carry on they're incredible really and um, nikki said my lovely tabby had a tumor on his pancreas the vets took a while to find out exactly what was wrong but once it was found it was a no-brainer for me yeah for my husband he was keen to go for radiotherapy which only give us three more months if that and those three months be purely made up of vet visits and treatment, which we couldn't cure him anyway. I just couldn't entertain putting him through anymore and I wanted him to go with dignity. The vet came to our home and he simply went to sleep in my arms in his favorite blanket. That's really, it's horrible. they're horrible to read in a way because I know, I know exactly your pain. It is much love conservatory with a belly full of poached chicken. It was actually very beautiful and I have no regrets at all. I know I made the right decision for my lad. That's a very hard diagnosis, cancer. Um, I think when you're being offered chemo or radiotherapy, uh, because my sister recently went through this with her dog and she opted for chemotherapy. And actually, if anything, it, it was very difficult because he didn't have very long anyway. Again, probably about three months like you were going to have with your cat. And like you say, three months of a lot of vet visits and a lot of you know disruption to normal life and then not feeling well after the chemo and it was really you know and actually it I mean she now regrets that you know that was about four weeks he survived after starting chemo and she says I think he probably would have survived four weeks anyway and now did I lose that time so she's doing the same and beating herself up um, Isabel said my 15 year old cat hadn't eaten for 48 hours and was leaning over his water but not drinking and went to hide behind the washing machine he didn't wait he didn't want to be around anyone I took him to the vet and they suggested he went to hospital on a drip but I felt it would be too traumatic for him as he hated to be away from us so you know your pets best and that's this is a true this is very much like the way why I say to people I think you you need to make the, the decision I actually said that I thought the kindest thing was to euthanize him because he was so unhappy and cried when the vet examined him and touched his abdomen I was with him until the end he went peacefully I still feel a bit guilty but I really didn't want him to suffer anymore as he was the most loving cat usually um yeah and I I totally agree with you again you know vets will I swear it's it's the conversation that they'll sometimes you know I I saw a dog probably about six months ago that looked really awful like I didn't I didn't even well I knew there was nothing really we could do for him and he had multiple tumors and lots of things going on 
And the first thing I did when the lady arrived, and obviously probably broached it completely wrong, said it brought him to be put to sleep today. And she's like, no, no way. I'm, I'm, I'm not ready for that. And that was really shocking to me because from the app, for me looking in, I was like, wow, this, this, this dog looks so ill. So I was like, okay, okay, well, let me just assess him. And I think just even mentioning those words, it, within about 10 minutes, she was like, why do you think that's what I should do? And sort of then opened up the conversation. I was like, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, but I think that it was really hard because I couldn't gauge her. I thought, I literally thought that's possibly why she was here because the dog did look so awful and obviously probably caused her to you know, get quite upset because it wasn't on her agenda, but she did and she did put him to sleep and it was the best decision. Um, yeah, I agree, Emily. Emily's had the horrible time with Lucky. It's not been nice at all. Um, Isabel says, oh, your cat had lots of health issues. Exactly. And I think that's the other thing as well. It goes back to the age old thing that you do know your pet best. And there is this thing, you know, they'll go to the vets and they will put on a front quite a lot of the time. And I think, you know, we can't just go on that and how I can't go on a 15 minute consultation because you know them. And there's been situations where I remember seeing a dog that looked really well. And the owner said to me, first thing she said is, don't let him fool you. He's really ill. Like at home, he's doing nothing. And I know he's something seriously wrong. And he did, he had really awful pancreatitis. But that dog on the outside, even on the clinical exam, looked normal because he was almost like, yeah, I'm not even going to wince. I'm not even going to show anything. And the bloods were terrible. Um, and he, he got better. So that was a nice success story. But he felt terrible. And she insisted, no, I know him. You don't. And I was like, no, I agree. You do know him. Um, and Stephanie says a Border Terrier Luna is 18 now and has dementia. Oh, that's a really tough one with dementia. I find it very hard to make a distinction between changes due to that and those that would be palliative. Is there any advice you could have on this, please? Dementia is a very, very difficult um, situation to deal with. I, I, on a very side note here, Stephanie, and I, you can always message me privately if you'd like to on this, but animals with dementia, I find that I say it all the time, um, I'm just writing on here for you as a thing, but I find keto sauce or MCT oil, have a read up and look into that. And it's very good for cognitive function. And you might find that actually it really clears the brain. I find quite a lot of animals do very well on MCT oil. Um, if you do feel that it is, you know, mainly the dementia that's getting her, it, that would be my offering of something that you could try that you might not have tried already. And it's something that you can source. If you do use something like that oil, you must use it, add it really slowly, like especially in an older dog who is very sensitive, you know, literally sort of a quarter of a teaspoon daily and then um, build it up to a teaspoon twice a day over a period of weeks. But you might find, I've had some dogs do very well on that. That can be used in people as well with dementia. Yes. And there's some amazing studies around that. Have a look at that, um, Natalia, because it's actually incredible stuff. Um, that's amazing. So Karen said one of her boys, uh, I think I know, I know this, anyway, but, but one of my boys lived for two and a half years after chemo. The lymphoma never came back. Lost him and my other boy last September. Do you think... In a multi-pet household, they are clever at hiding just how ill they are. Yes, I do think there is an element of that. And they've got the others to kind of rally them along. Um, and I do think, obviously, there is that pack mentality. And they, like, to, I'll to give you an example. My dog, Izzy, she was she was the top dog in this house. You know, I've got three male dogs and she ruled the roost. And I think that she she was still, you know, nipping at their heels and telling them off right to the end. Um, and the day I made the decision, she hadn't done that all day. She was almost like, I don't care. Like, I'm not going to growl at you. I'm not going to tell you off. And I thought, oh, gosh. But she did. I think it probably kept her going longer than, than if she was on her own. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I bet you've had that question, Carrie, a few times, haven't you, about other animals grieving in the household? Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there is a lot of debate, I think, out there as to whether animals do grieve. But... Um, I mean, this this might sound a little bit nerdy, I don't know, but um, when I was studying my thanatology diploma, we were going through like grief and grieving and, we, and um, mammals and how, um, because of like the limbic system, I think it is, we have, they have the capacity to yeah. grieve. Yeah. And, the, and so I do, personally, I, 
I do strongly feel that animals do grieve uh, mm -hmm. because they've lost um, a companion and um, the you know the living arrangements changed. They they might not know what happened, especially if they've not seen the you know maybe the body of their companion. And I do think that that they grieve um, like like we do. It, um, and so I think it is important to just rule out any possible um, med med medical reasons for changes in the behaviours, like you say. But um, other than that, I do think that they have the capacity to, to grieve and, yeah. and do so. Yeah, and Isabel, as Isabel said here that with her cat, she um, did show her other cat um, his body and but thinks that that might have confused him a bit. And it probably, I think it probably maybe is like that for some animals. I think it, again, I think they all take it very differently. I look at my own experiences and when I have my, when, when I put my spaniel to sleep, Izzy, who I lost recently, we buried him at home and she laid on that grave until I finally said, look, you've got to come inside, which was quite late and she wouldn't get off. Um, and she often used to sit on there, like, you know, just sit on sit on top, you know, or by there. Um, whereas I look at my other dogs when I put Izzy to sleep and the first thing that they did, <laughs> just to add a bit of light humour into this evening, was Albie came up where I just took, was I buried Izzy as well? And as I picked her up and took her outside, he came up to where she was lying, cocked his leg. And then he tapped the other two in the house as if to say, I'm top dog now. And that's how he sort of dealt with it. So I think they do. I think, you know, my, I mean, all my animals have always seen the other, but that's because I guess the nature of my job and most of these things I do at home. So the other animals are around. Um, some of the other comments on here as well. Amy said um, she lost um, her boy to cancer. It took a while to diagnose as the vet first thought it was heart issues. He had a lot of fluid on his lungs to so had to be in an oxygenated crate at the vets. We decided not to try chemo as the vet said it was a really slim chance of working due to the type of cancer he had. Yeah, it was the hardest decision we've ever had to make because when we went to say goodbye, he was still so excited. Oh, no, this is that's the yeah, and happy to see us. That's 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 the thing, they just keep pushing through. But after a few minutes, we could tell he was struggling, so we knew we were ultimately making the right decision. And you're right, they can be so good at sort of putting on the act almost and pleasing you. But I think if you know it's very short lived and it's not normal, then then that is just them just trying to give it a little push, really. But they're not feel, obviously not feeling great. Um, and answer to your question, Tracy. No, so MCT oil comes from coconut oil. So <clears throat> I don't use coconut oil to deliver the MCT. I use it in its pure form. This is for the dementia again, um, just because coconut oil can cause some gut issues in some dogs and cats. Um, so I tend to use the pure form of the MCT, just to answer your question on the coconut oil. Um, and Claire says um, she's a groomer, I don't know, and I had a dog that's, um, the, the owner, the husband, hang on, let me, I've read that one wrong, wrong way, I had, I am a, a groomer and I had a dog that's owner, the husband, had died and I believe she was grieving, she was not herself at all during appointments for a while. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, I think animals definitely do grieve and they grieve in different ways like we do you know some people just don't show up with emotion and some people you know will just carry on and and fight and find that maybe it's like me actually I'm very much like that I don't I don't always show that outward emotion for my own dogs but at home I find that's when I find it really hard um Emma said our rescue cat Bailey fell fell ill over a weekend fed him chicken uh chicken smoothie oh chicken smoothie and took him to the vet as he clearly was not well Di uh, diarrhea and i felt a lump in his abdomen the vet decided to biopsy it and he bled he stayed in the hospital for a week for results and stabilizing and seemed to recover slightly we wanted him home to be put to sleep we got a call early morning from the vet to say he collapsed we took his blanket and I held him whilst they put him to sleep my wish is that i'd taken the gut decision rather than be led by the vet regarding the biopsy yeah that too because you don't know who you, you don't know that's the thing and I think that's why you ask lots of questions when things are thrown at you like that like you know options for treatment if you feel again if you feel that's what you want and you've come to that decision in your mind then I think you must do what you feel is right 
Um, but it is difficult because if there's that slight hope, you're going to cling to that too. Um, when my border terrier came to the end of her life, I made arrangements for the vet to come to the house and it helped to hold her and her to be in her environment. That's the perfect bit, isn't it, really? If you can have a vet come to your house. And there are a lot of practices now that it might be that you have to arrange a vet that you don't know. So not your usual day clinic. Um, and it might be that they don't offer those home visits, but there are lots of vets now that offer palliative care and end of life services only so it doesn't mean that you just need to call them on the day you know they'll come over and they'll see you or they'll meet your pet you can get a feel for them and see if you like who they are and you feel comfortable um, and I would say that's one of the things in preparing that you need to think about um, I know you can't always because sometimes they go with no decision and you've got to just go to the clinic and, and that's it but if you can that's something that I would start thinking about is who in your area does that any recommendations can you meet that home vet, get to know them, they get to know your pet, make sure you feel right about that, because um, that will really help if you get a plan. Um, yeah, definitely, um, Haley. I definitely believe they grieve too. Uh, it's definitely, oh yeah, definitely look up the MCT. Oh, activate, that, yes, that's activates very good for dementia dogs too, and there's Nutrimind as well, but you might find the MCT just really tips up a little bit more and makes it feel a bit better um yes and you're right there is a difficulty between knowing if a, an animal has dementia or if it is that they're showing more end of life symptoms that is quite tricky um the two can look very similar but i think if there a lot of the other symptoms seem quite good like they still usually with dementia it's worse at night and um, the symptoms seem to worsen when it's night time um and if you feel like you know that there are other aspects of them that seem very normal then I think that it more likely to be um the dementia that's causing the major the major issue um let's have a little look here I have a little schnauzer I have a little schnauzer now she arrived seven years ago joining a chocolate lab and the golden retriever both boys now gone she's just devastated and just so low she's trying to be friends with the cats oh my goodness that's really sad um Karen your third boy was terrible he'd never know life without his two brothers I really thought I was going to lose him yeah and I've seen that other dogs go really downhill medically or behaviorally when another another one has um has, has got you know an animal has died um Alice your Jack Russell is just getting old she sleeps a lot totters around and has some dementia she still likes attention and loves her food Poos and wheeze are a little arbitrary. She definitely is declining. She's completely deaf, but can hear the reverberations when my granddaughter plays the harp and goes close. Well, that's sweet. How am I going to tell when the decline is, is slow, when the moment is right? That really, really tacky answer to that, but it's true. Part of you will just know. Things will change. You will feel that um, perhaps things like, you know, although she totters around as long as she's able to find a spot and rest sometimes you know they'll get to the point where they can't settle they are pacing rather than just you know pottering and, and around things and I think also you might notice other signs like the weight loss like the changes in um diet it might be that she really does decide that she doesn't want to eat anything um uninterested in the activities that you put to her so even if she just still goes out for a little walk and things it might be she decides that she doesn't want to you will know that sounds and that sounds really sort of poor way of saying it but it's true I think you do know you, you definitely I think you just realize and I think what happens is we know but sometimes we don't want to admit to ourselves um Emma says, we scattered our boy and girl ashes in a plant together and our resident pet left behind at the time came to say goodbye and sniff them. <laughs> it's really sweet. And um, Patsy says, my Russian black terrier was a result of bad breathing and a puppy farm. He was ultra aggressive and was muzzled and on a lead at all times in public. When he became unwell, drinking loads and dropping weight, we took him to the vets who couldn't get anywhere near him because of the aggression. They gave us drugs to sedate him, but we couldn't get them near him. Eventually, outside the surgery, we had to hold him tight against the chain linked fence so they could inject the sedative into him and carry him in. Their investigations under anesthesia found he had mega esophagus, or that's an awful condition, which under normal circumstances it knew could be managed because of what he was like. 
he would not accept hand feeding and eating upright and certainly wouldn't have entertained vet visits to monitor his condition. He was so stressed going in there. I knew he would be even more stressed coming around without us being there because of COVID. So I made the decision to let him go under the anesthesia. I struggle with this decision on a daily basis. He was only five, but such a damaged soul. So you've done a really kind thing. I think it's a very, very important point that you've made there in the fact that that I often say that to people as well. You know, if you've got an animal, like for instance, I get some dogs in, it might even be something that we feel is a manageable and treatable condition. But we have to look at the animals, you know, I mean, Megasophagus is really difficult and actually a lot of them have a lot of horrible complications. So I think even the easiest dog is difficult to manage. But like diabetes, and an owner will say, you know, the injections are awful. I can't inject, inject them or I can't, do the medications, they, they're getting aggressive, you know, I can't keep the condition under control. And sometimes you have to make the decision because you've got a pet that's just not gonna, you know, accept the treatment. Um, and I think that's very difficult. What you've done there is very honorable because you've thought about him and the fact that he is not gonna enjoy having the medication and feeding in a certain way. And it's just not gonna happen. And I think that you've you've been brave. So I don't think the struggling decision, you should feel really brave that you've made that decision. So I think that's a really tough one. Um, Lisette says, um, my little dog, Toti, that's a very sweet name, is 16 and a half old, years old. He's not, he is not blind, a little bit deaf, uh, has a heart and has a heart that is becoming bigger. He has medication for that and goes well on it. They just found out that his liver has an unusual size and looks weird. There are spots found on his liver. Has he, well, he's supposed to maybe think that he might have cancer. We don't know. I don't want to do a biopsy because of his age. He looks still happy, likes to walk and eat. The vet gave him prednisolone, but in a few days, he looked like he was more death than alive and I stopped the prednisolone. After that, he feels much better and happier. He climbs the stairs to my apartment by himself. I said to the vet, prednisolone was destroying my little friend. So now three months later, he still goes well. Yeah, and I think, so prednisolone is a steroid and your vet might say, it, it is a sort of age saying really, that we do say that, you know, Steroids can sometimes buy sick dogs time um, and, you know, can make them feel a bit perkier. And obviously in the situation of your little dog, it didn't. And so I was give the chance for the owners um, to make that, you know, to get that decision in their head. So that's probably why they gave it. The spots on the liver could just be age that you know, livers can look really unusual in older pets. So it, it could well be that usually if it's cancer, quite a lot of the time, liver cancer will show up on bloods as well. Um, and it might just be that when he was taking the prednisolone, if his liver isn't functioning as it should, it might be that it was making him feel ill, like trying, trying to clear the drug. Um, Courtney says, as dog trainers, we've had several cases where we've requested vet checks due to aggressive behavior and they've ended up with things like brain tumors. Yeah. And being put to sleep. It's important not to ignore behavior changes for sure. Yes. hundred um, percent. Carrie, uh, Patsy, please have a look at losing Lulu on Facebook, a safe space group for those who have had to make a decision for behavioral euthanasia. Um, that's a really nice place. So that's Carrie, who's obviously joining me now. She just put a link on there. She's really handy, Carrie, if you do put anything in that chat that's useful for people. So losing Lulu on Facebook. Um, if you have to make a decision for behavioural euthanasia. That's really hard. We've just had a friend put their dog to sleep due to behavioural issues. Uh, and that's a very difficult, very, very difficult decision to make. Um, my 15 year old lab has CCD, but rather than the usual dementia symptoms that affect his long nerves, which means messages aren't getting back from brain to back legs properly, his symptoms are very similar to DM, but is not DM, diabetes mellitus. Oh no, degenerative myelopathy. He walks with wheels outside the home now, but can still get around at home on his own mostly. I've uh, have had him booked in three times in the last 18 months and each time he's rallied so strongly I know that's something that happens too that I've cancelled I had seen him um by my regular vet who's known him for years oh hang on I'm going past myself because also I want to check that I'm not missing anything I don't want to that because I don't want to see it that's true sometimes you can definitely not choose that you don't want to see the decline I think that's very normal 
who wants to you know you don't you don't want to have to admit it do you to yourself both he and my boys my therapy therapist say he doesn't feel any worse pain wise he's still engaged and has a good quality of life and that is the key quality of life that's what you that's exactly what you want to look for that they are they have a quality of life um I'm lucky that I rarely have to leave him and that I can do all the palliative care for him I'm just waiting for him to tell me he's had enough but at the same time, I worry I might be misunderstanding. His spirit still seems strong. He still tries to elongate every walk, but his gait is awful. I think as well um, that it is definitely, like you say, looking at the quality of life. And occasionally, if things if, if things seem to be, so like with the cases with people saying, you know, just getting old, am I, you know, how am I supposed to know? Or dementia, how am I supposed to know? Sometimes that vet visit can be invaluable and just say, or, or a friend, those are, those are times where you think you need to get someone from the outside to look in and just tell you what they're seeing. What do they see? What do they, you know, what, what do they feel? That, what sort of life do they feel that the pet has? I think that's really important. I'll go back to those comments in a minute. I'm just going to flick across here and just talk a little bit about this. And then I'll go back. I'll come back to yours, Isabel, in a second. I think you need to plan the day. I am going to let Carrie talk as well in a second. I just um, thought I'd just go through a few bits first. But I think you really, if you can plan, I know that things don't always go to plan. So you have to you have to have that in your mind as well, that it might not go how you want it to go. But try to take the pressure off yourself. If you can book some time off work, if you can like even give yourself a bit of time leading up to it, you know, the day before that you've decided that perhaps, you know, Tuesday you're going to, to book in an appointment and have them put to sleep. Perhaps, if you know, you can have Monday off and just have that time. Can you have any time off after you know can you explain that it is okay it might not be a person because this is the trouble isn't it everyone sort of will give you bereavement or, or time off for bereavement of a person but not so much animals but I definitely think you know see if you can work it out that you can give yourself some time um speak to the clinic if you are going in and, and you are taking your pet into the clinic that's asked when it is a quiet time from my experience, usually that's kind of early afternoon. So um, evenings are usually quite busy. So I think, you know, try and find a time that is quiet. As I said, you might have to use a def different vet if you want someone to come to you and speak to your, your um, vets about that and find out like, honestly, like how much notice do you need? Like, are you gonna sort of, are you gonna kind of deprive me of this if I literally ring after on Monday morning and say, today's the day, you know, how, how easy is that for you to get someone to me? Because you don't you don't want then your plans to be blown out because you, you can't get somebody to you. Um, if your pet is in a hospital, it doesn't matter if the hospital seems like it's busy and things are going on. You know, I, I always make sure that I, if the pet is well enough to leave um, where they're sleeping, then I'll set up a separate room and put you in there and say, you know, I'll come in in sort of 15 20 minutes if you tell me you know, I've had people in, that have done two hours they've had two hours or more before they then said okay now I feel I'm ready so don't don't feel like you need to rush so sometimes it is better I know this sounds awful but sometimes it is better to go earlier in the day so that you've got more time you don't feel like anyone's waiting to leave you know you don't want that stuff on your brain like on your head or on your mind um maybe have a friend or family with you that you feel that would help you um but never feel rushed do take as long as you need and have a plan afterwards and I think that's easier to do on the day because uh, the day before or a few days before and by that I mean that on the day sometimes you're sort of bombarded with stuff you need to sign a consent form that the vet has to get you to sign to say that you know this is your decision and then it is the worst thing I find it the worst thing as a vet sometimes to have to ask the question I never know whether to ask it before or ask it afterwards of what you're going to do with their body and it's horrible because I'm always like I never know when to gauge it because I think I never want to ask you before because they're still here I don't want to ask you after because sometimes you're just too emotionally upset some people I say to them just go home and then just ring us in a couple of days and we'll talk about that but you might want to make a plan beforehand and decide I'm going to have them buried or I'm going to have them cremated or I'm going to get the ashes back or I'm not going to get the ashes back. 
you know, if, if cost falls into that factor, look into it, find out what you what your options are. There are some crematoriums you can visit yourself. And I have some owners do that. They'll have their pet put to sleep with me. Then we will um, make sure they're all safe in a, in a basket or in the bed and pop them into the owner's car and they'll drive their pet to the crematorium themselves and they'll wait for the ashes. Um, so that is an option. You can do that. I just don't think many people always tell you that is an option. Um, and then if you do have ashes back, there's another option. Do you want to scatter them? Do you want to keep them? So I think, you know, again, to think about that. Do I always want to have their ashes or do I want to go to a certain place and scatter them? Do I want to have the option to, you know, you might want to turn some into jewellery? I know these are all horrible things to think of because they're still with you, but I think a plan is a good idea. And then you can, and again, write it down if you think I'm not gonna be able to think about all of this. Um, and then decide if you want to stay on the day or not. No one's gonna judge you. You know, if you feel you can't be there till the end, um, then you need to make that decision. If you can, then, then do, and make sure you know you are part of the whole process. What other things do you think leading up to this, Carrie, that, that people can do to try and protect their own well-being, like heading up for the day that they're going to go, they're going to go through this? Um, I mean, I noticed in the chat somebody's asking whether the, their pet can have their breakfast. And I just wanted to say this is more for it is like for your own well-being, but also for your pets, is um maybe giving them like a last um, meal of, of forbidden treats um, like chocolate cake uh, a McDonald's or a burger you know something that they're not normally allowed um, this is something that they will enjoy but then you as the owner would enjoy seeing them enjoying themselves eating this forbidden meal um, but as you said you know trying to plan ahead as much as possible which I know isn't always feasible especially if it's if it's um, a sudden decision or yeah. it's uh, an emergency. Um, but like you said, just making sure that you know what your practice offers and where, and what other options you have so that if on the day you can't go with your original plan, what is the backup? Yeah. Um, and um, I suppose it's, um, as you say, having somebody, having somebody with you um making sure you've got an alternative method of getting home um because i used to worry about people driving home just after euthanasia yeah so obviously they'd be so upset um but i think if you can have a discussion with your vet um prior and then i think you, i think it's the fear of the unknown that adds to to the distress um and not knowing what to expect so I think if it's possible for you to speak to your vet about what actually happens during euthanasia, um, what may happen, and this is, um, I think this is why it's important that vets and uh, veterinary staff explain um, what may happen that is normal to us as veterinary staff and yeah. we prepare for and deal with, but to a pet owner may look more distressing than it than it, it is yeah but, so our normal is their abnormal um so finding out what actually happens what to expect and why the why things may happen and what the vets would do to um if that if those things happened yeah um but afterwards i think definitely planning um, something for yourself, something completely selfless, like, I don't know, um, going for a walk, um, just, you know, meeting up with friends, just having no expectations of the day, no responsibilities later on, just, mm -hmm. just time for you to just sit and absorb and reflect and, um, you know, just just think about yourself for, for a change rather than your companion and others. Just focus on your well-being in that moment, and you know, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and it's really important. And I've just actually what Carrie was saying there, I've just put on done a little slide here of what happens on the day. And some of you may never have ever had an animal put to sleep. And I, I promise I'll go back to all the chat comments in a minute as well. We can um, go over those together. But I thought it's important to put this on here for various reasons. As I say, you may never have had a pet put to sleep. And I think it's important that you know what happens. So again, if you've got to go to the clinic or even if someone's coming to you, but you know that, you know, your pet is really anxious, just about like, the, obviously, um, the lady with the um, Black Russian Terrier, they obviously, that was difficult to get sedation in, you know, but now, I mean, we've got, so we have a few different types of sedative that can be given. And again, if they've got a good appetite, then it's usually easier than to get that in because you can give them something like a big chocolate cake. Um, and and get those drugs in but you can request those if you think to yourself no I know I'm going to the clinic but I know that my pet gets really anxious then as I say you can request that this is put up for you ready you can collect it you can give it to them in the morning or whenever it is a little bit of time before you go and have it that they have got some sedation on board so that they feel more relaxed and that might make you feel less stressed then um Small animals are definitely a little trickier when it comes to euthanasia. Now, when it comes to rabbits and guinea pigs and larger rodents, we can often do those now with you present. But smaller um, animals um, might be that they're, they're taken away from you. And I think that's really hard. Um, it's all about trying to get a vein for drugs and sometimes with the smaller smaller animals they have to be anesthetized first and because of the way that's all set up sometimes they are taken away from you and I think that's that can be very difficult in that situation but most of the other animals though are going to come back to you you will be asked to sign that consent form and I think that does feel quite horrible because you're you're saying yes and you're confirming it by signing um you can again you can tell reception you want to wait in the car you don't have to sit and wait in the in the um the waiting room and at the clinic that i'm at we have a special room where you we just take you straight in there and again after when you leave you can leave by a, a different e exit if you want to you don't have to walk out in front of everybody you don't have to you know again you can think these things through about how you might feel or just at least know there are options to you and you can say I don't want to walk out that way can I go out an alternative door and again that's completely fine and I, you know and actually quite a lot of the time I ask that anyway but not everybody will quite a lot of them I'll say oh do you want to just come out this way then you don't have to go through um to the three past the reception. Now, I think this is hard. Some people might not realize, but a lot of the time, the pet may be taken away from you for, for a little piece of time, and that's to place an intravenous catheter um, into a vein. And we do that really for a couple of reasons. Sick pets can have really poor blood vessels. It can be very difficult to find them. And getting an IV line in, putting the line in ready, means that we've got that access. Often I'll put that in and then leave the owner for as much time as they like, but I know it's there, I know it's in place. And I know that if you want to cuddle them or have them on your lap, or you want to lie on the floor with them or whatever you want to do, you can, because I've got that access. I don't need a nurse raising a vein or anything like that. So I do think that is a nicer option. Um, and then again, you stay as long as you like after the pet's been put to sleep. Don't feel you need to be rallied out of a room. And again, if you feel like that might happen, if you're sat there thinking my clinic, that's what would happen because they've only got one vet and one consulting room or something, then have that conversation again beforehand. I don't, I don't want that. So maybe they'll say, OK, well, well, why don't we make you the last appointment of the day? Make sure you get plenty of time then to, to, to stay. You might not want to stay. People are very different you know some people want to stay for a period of time I make them a cup of tea they want to sit they want to talk to me about their pet they want to tell me all the stories and I'm and I, I always you know very happy to hear that and sometimes they'll they'll laugh because they're thinking about all the funny things they did and and it helps and I think again you know that's why you might want somebody with you or it might be that you feel your vet would be like that so you can sit and you can you can sort of talk to them and um, Think about the things that you want to do there and then. Taking a hair clipping. Again, that's not, we get that all the time. It's not unusual if you think, I, I want to take a piece of hair, I want to do that before you go. But if you want to do it there, 
and take their collar. If they have collar or anything with the, on them at the time. And also you can do a paw print and some of your clinics will actually be set up so that they can do the paw print for you if you want to. They'll have ink and a, and a setup. You know, quite a lot of clinics do that now. It's a lot to think about, but it's like making almost like a little list of things of how, how would I want it to be? How will it make me feel better and, and my, my pet feel better if I've got it all organised beforehand and I've got a bit of a plan? I know not everything always goes to plan, but some of these things you can, you know, like the paw print and the collar and, you know, having the time, you can do that you know, regardless. And finally, um, sorry, uh, go on, yeah, Carrie, go on, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to uh, just mention regarding um, asking for a paw print or whatever. Um, if you decide to leave your pet for cremation and allow the practice to organise that, yeah. um, if you wanted to leave a toy or a blanket, it may be worth just double checking with the crematorium that they're able to cremate them with those items. Yeah, that's a really good um, idea. Because um, I know that some crematoriums aren't allowed to cremate the blankets because of the materials, but they could take a swatch, um, which they can, if mm. you wanted like a token, um, but just to be aware that it may not be that they, they get cremated together. So it, it was just to put out there just in case yeah anyone thought oh you know they'll have definitely gone with their blanket or their toy and they may have gone to the crematorium together but they may not have been cremated together they yeah just, just to just... it said no that's a really really I know it's a very good point actually and I think and also when you were saying that then as well I was just thinking that on the day of euthanasia as well like you were saying about the nice food again actually uh, this is a question I asked my partner before I put Izzy to sleep do you want her to be put to sleep while she's eating and he sort of looked at me like I was mad and I said well I mean as in we had a chocolate cake actually for her but she didn't have it in the end but and I said do you, do you want her to have that cake while she goes to sleep and he said no I don't I want I want to cuddle her I don't want her to eat um now it's not a conversation I usually have with owners I did with him obviously but again it might be something that you say actually I've brought this and I really want him or her to have this um or you might think that's not what you want but again that's it, it you can do that like don't you know if you have got your full-blown McDonald's and you think well I, I want to sit here and they have their McDonald's and you know then then do like don't don't feel bad about that either um it's really fast once the drugs are given which is an anesthetic basically. So it is painless. But once those drugs are given, the actual part from injecting um, Pentajet or whatever the drug is that's going in are given, that's often a real shock for some people because it's very quick. I mean, it can be seconds and they're gone. And I think that's something that's very important to know because it, it can be quite a shock, I think. And that for some people sort of say, have they gone already? They have, and it can be really that fast. Now, a lot of them won't close their eyes. The majority of animals won't close their eyes. And that's something else that you might find shocking because a lot, you know, it doesn't with people, we can actually physically shut their eyes. In animals, we can't do that. And so, again, that might be something that you find quite distressing if you weren't to know that. And the other thing that can be distressing is that after they've been put to sleep, it can happen for several minutes, but they can have this twitching. They can have what looks like a gasping or breathing. And there's been some cases where they've made like almost like a little whining noise after. And owners will say to me, they haven't gone. And I said, they, they have, but you know, obviously they weren't prepared to see that, weren't prepared to see that movement. They might move leg, a leg or, you know, look like they're taking a breath. And sometimes they take almost like a deep breath in um, once they've gone. And I think, again, it's important to know that because it might be very startling and you might think what, what's going on. Um, this is something my friend said to me when I said I was doing this this evening. She said to me, one thing I'd like to say is, is that I took my cat home to be buried and nobody warned me that when I'd pick her up, because she goes, and I suppose it was obvious, but I didn't think she was so floppy. Like it was just nothing. And I kind of felt quite stressed picking her up. I didn't, I just, I just sort of thought it, I didn't think about that. So I think, again, that's something to think of, you know, again, if you are going to take them home or you know, take them to the crematorium. They might pass urine and feces. So again, that's something you know, when they relax their bladder and their bowel. 
And if they've got breathing difficulties, this happened with my dog, actually, Izzy, she had quite a lot of bloody fluid come from her nose. Um, and again, that can look quite horrible if you've not seen that before. So I think it's just to really know that those things, are gonna, you know, some of those things may happen. It might be all of them. It might be a few of them. There's also times when animals are really flat and um, it's very difficult to to get to find a vein, a blood vessel to go into. So it might be that your vet suggests that they are sedated and perhaps they're not given an injection into their leg and maybe it goes somewhere else, like a kidney or a heart, which sounds horrible when I say that out loud, but it might be that that, that plan changes, you know, and they do something different. And you might think, what are they doing? that's often because the blood circulation is so poor that they just cannot or you have situations where you put the IV line in you inject the drug and it just it, it just blow, like the, the line doesn't work anymore so some of those things might not go go to plan on that side of it as well um it's going to go back to these chat here and see we got to Isabel I know um let's have a little look and we'll go through some of these and then I'll let Carrie have a little chat about other things you can, anything else you can do for yourself. Um, it is really hard though. And I think that it's difficult to know exactly when, but I think the bottom line is you really know. I wonder if it's hard for vets. I said that I thought Prince would hate being in hospital as he was very close to my husband. I said, would she think euthanasia was an option? And she said she agreed that it was a good option for him due to his health issues and age once I mentioned it. It was so nice to be with him and cuddling him and telling him I loved him as he slipped away. I think sometimes it is really hard for vets because we're always gauging, like we almost don't want to offend, I think sometimes, and not because we'd ever, you know, allow the well-being of an animal to be compromised for offending the person. I, I wouldn't, I would be, you know, very honest. But sometimes people... You know, there are some treatments that might, they're not going to maybe necessarily cure them, but might buy more time and maybe a significant amount of time. And so it's very difficult because you suggest those and then it's like, well, did they really want that? Or do they actually feel that maybe they, they don't want that? So again, it's good just to say what your agenda is. There's nothing worse. I had one recently where husband and wife couldn't agree. And that was awful. One was like, I want to put, him, put her to sleep. And the other one said no. Um, and in the end, they didn't. And she she died at home overnight. Um, Vicky said, our old girl struggled with uh, sundowner syndrome for her last year, but she was otherwise happy and healthy. We didn't know if that was enough of a reason to let her go as she still enjoyed walks, food and her daily routine. And again, I think if a lot of those core aspects are still there, um, then I think, you know, you, you, I think, you know, that you've, there's always got those sort of basic, the basic things are there. It might just be some of the extra things that go, but as long as you're not then going into that, they don't want to go for a walk. They don't want to eat their food. You know, they don't um, want to have any attention. Then once those sort of general enjoying life aspects go, then I think, you know, that you're going over the, over to the other side. Um, I honestly think you need to let them go if they struggle with taking a lot of meds. Yes, it can also put a strain on your relationship with your pet and spoil the bonds you have. Yes, I had exactly that with someone really struggling with a very sick dog and medication. And the bottom line was it of it was that he got bitten badly on his face. And that was not a dog that was aggressive. It was a dog that was very painful. And um, she 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 died probably within 48 hours of causing that bite and I think that must have been a very difficult thing for that man to have to then come to terms with that so I, I agree um I think you've got to think of like again it's quality of life and their well-being and if you feel like you've got to force something upon them that you know is going to be a struggle then I agree you don't um quality of life is the main question for me and I think making a decision to let a beloved animal companion go is the last act of pure love Yes, absolutely. We can show them. I never fear losing them now, but I do fear letting them go on longer than they should and be in pain or discomfort or just not living their best life. I think that's a really lovely thing. And I think the fact that you're right, it is. A, you have to look at it like that, that you are giving them something quite special really in the fact that you don't, that you don't have to be like some people that have to just fade away over a period of time. You can actually you know, stop that situation and that prolonged um, 
you know maybe maybe suffering you know might you know you you're going to stop it basically you'll be able to stop it Natasha said I've had the privilege of letting most of my babies go with my vet but for me congenital heart failure is the worst demon most of my other kids have had conditions where a child deteriorates in stages unless really aggressive my boy was doing amazing with his heart until the warm weather over 26 degrees it just took him quite literally in a heartbeat I never got I got to say goodbye to my baby our vets always said he did an amazing job as he stayed with me for 18 months and I know that is true but it still feels that I was robbed as I never got to hold him and say goodbye my poor husband saw the effect of the situation and said that my boy went as soon as he heard my voice as I ran through the oh, oh sorry as I ran through the Hang on, sorry, I ran through the back door like he was waiting for me. By the time I made it to my baby, he was gone. This was three years ago, and I don't think I'll ever adapt to the predicament of his passing. Now I'm mentally preparing myself as I have another child who has the same condition. He has been on meds for over a year and not yet has fluid around the lungs. But this awful weather scares me. I know the same is going to happen to my other boy, but he still has quality at the moment. It's awful as it feels like the heart is a ticking time bomb rather than deteriorating in stages to give an indication of letting them go home to rainbow bridge you're absolutely right heart conditions can be really awful because they can literally go from being fairly normal to heart failure fairly quickly and again you don't get that time um emily again with lucky um he's going to be crossing the bridge soon we found a vet who after consultation and checking his latest ultrasound and blood works agreed to let him go how do I prepare him? Can I feed him in the morning? Yes, you can. That's what you were answering, Carrie. Can he have his painkillers in the morning? Yes, he can. Um, that was, what was I going to say to you then? Ah, so if you have a situation where you have a pet in your care, let's say for argument's sake, and I know this would be really difficult if you had a business and a situation, but if you had an animal that you felt was in a serious, um, seriously distressed and the owner was not around, and perhaps they were being difficult. Now, I know Emily's in different countries, so it's, it's, it's hard, but harder for her. But if you um, were in that position, two vets can agree. If, if you've got two vets in the clinic that both agree and say, I think euthanasia is the kindest option, then you can actually do it without any consent from the owner just so you know that if you're ever in that predicament. Um, but yeah, so you can do it without an owner signing, if, if there, but there has to be two vets. And often I will make some video footage as well as a, just to kind of show that, you know, this was the right decision. Um, and then, oh, that's nice. It's because the vet showed me a list of options for ashes. And I just said I was going to take him home and bury him in the garden. And then she kindly helped me put him in a natural position once he died in his box on top of the blanket. It was really touching. Yes, and I think that's true. Yeah, you, again, totally agree. When I when I had to put Izzy to sleep, it was about half past 11 at night. So we were going to bury her and we hadn't prepared anything really. So we made a decision that we'd put her somewhere cool overnight and then bury her in the morning. But uh, because rigor mortis can kick in, they can go really hot, you know, really um, stiff. I made sure again that she was in that, like you say, like a natural position so that I didn't have to, you know, so she didn't have to move, you know, try and force any movement or anything. Um, Natalia, my dog will get a sirloin steak, forget McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true, actually. Um, Emily said, lucky we'll be having an autopsy right after he passes away. We are set for 6 p.m. Can he? Yeah, he can definitely still have his food in the morning and he can eat. So with the euthanasia, he can eat. They can eat whilst they're even being put to sleep. So I say that there's no holes barred on that. Um, Emma said, Tilly, my border terrier, had chicken with a cup of tea after for her last tea. Her cat brother helped her with the chicken. These are really sad, aren't they, when you read them? But um, Nikki, it's a very personal decision with what to do afterwards. I actually got a huge sense of relief in getting both my cat's ashes. They are both at home in their favorite rooms. Felt like I was bringing them home again and I chat to them all the time. I agree. That's probably something you hear of as well. Do you carry like people probably do different things to make, you know, whatever makes them feel sort of better? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like I said, there's, um, there's uh, different options and I think nobody can really tell you um what's the right what's right or and you know what what you should do it's a very personal decision as you said um, for some people they find that having the ashes returned is um 
a visual reminder where like like, like you say Nikki you can you talk to them yeah. and it's nice. uh, you know uh, friends of mine have have built um almost like um a shrine almost like they ded they dedicated a shelf in a cabinet to the, the loved ones ashes and my uh, my my ratty boys um are on my bookshelf because I love books and I loved my boys so they're, they're all together um but for so I do appreciate that for some people the having the ashes back may be too much of a visual reminder maybe too painful yeah. um yeah. but the way I sort of reframe that is that some people may look at them as a reminder that they've gone but i say well we'll try to look at it as a reminder that they lived and mm -hmm. that you know the memories that associated with them and um but then for other people they would prefer uh, a burial um, in the garden and choose um I, I remember when my my old boss there his cat died and I went out and bought um, a, a rose specifically to go over um, what is burial plot because um, I love this cat to bits. And um, obviously, it wasn't it wasn't up to me what what he did with it with her afterwards. But I, I went out and bought a rose for her. Um, but yeah, like there's uh, paw print jewelry. There's um, so many actually, nice things, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. As in, there's so many nice, there's actually a lot of things, and I'm not sure people always know that they can, you know, have those options. Yeah, there's, there's so much when you think about it. There's, um, as there's ashes into glass, um, I think there's a company on Etsy that made this beautiful glass rainbow that incorporates the ashes. Um, there's jewellery, um, well, um, there's, um, I, I think there's an artist who, um, this is like for a horse owners, they they do paintings, but they use part of the horse hair as the yeah. mane and tail of the foot in the picture. Yeah. Um, or they make bracelets with the mane and the and the tail. And um, there's there's so many options. Uh, and even um, I know this isn't for everybody, but um, there are those that may go down the taxidermy route, which again I know isn't everyone's cup of tea. Um, but it's it's about what will bring you comfort in the days ahead, you know. So, you know, whatever you feel um, fits your lifestyle, fits your, um, you know, your I don't know, just your your grief and what what you think will bring you most comfort. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think also as well, never be afraid to change your mind. You might. Yeah. You might have the discussion with the vet the two days or week or you know maybe even a month before it might be you know you might say oh could you pop on my record that this would be my request but once you put you know the pet has been put to sleep you might feel totally different because I mean I was always adamant that I would get my dog's ashes back and I would scatter them in the places that they really enjoyed and I completely changed my mind and ended up burying them, which I, I never thought I would do that. But after they'd gone, I just felt that's what I wanted to do. And I completely changed what I thought I would do. But it's fine to, you know, it's fine to change your mind. Don't, you know, if you feel like, oh, I, I, no, I've changed my mind. You know, I, I want to do something different. Then, you know, just you can. Um, so just going through some of these messages again, there's so many nice messages. Stephanie said, you can also take a paw print. Yes, and keep some fur. Fur or ashes can be made into jewellery. That's what we're saying. Um, oh, Natalia says, lovely advice. That's good. Um, no, that doesn't sound crazy at all, Isabel. Um, she's, she's made a little memorial garden for Prince and I speak to him. I think it's very important. I think, you know, it's a very nice thing in terms of, you know, I think sometimes speaking out loud is a, is a really good way of grieving. I, I think that's kind of how I deal with things as well, sort of almost have a little conversation with them still, because I, th I I just think it's a night, you know, you might, to other people, it might be like, what's she talking to herself for? But you know why. And and I think it's another nice thing you can do to help yourself feel better. Yeah. yeah. It's a nice thing. Um, Karen said that your nephew had to have his 
Springer put to sleep a few weeks ago, the vet actually gave Jack a chocolate from a special jar and said no dog should go to heaven without having tasted chocolate. They also lit a candle in the waiting room so people waiting were aware. I really like it when vet practices do that. Um, I think it's very important. And then usually, you know, people are just that bit more respectful. And also in terms of if they are late, like anything's running late or waiting for their appointment, people are usually a bit more understanding that, you know, someone else is having a really difficult time in another room um and I like the fact oh I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get a jar like that I think that's a really nice little touch and you know it's it's little things like that I think that can make you feel better as well because it is a really difficult thing so make sure as well I think that's important that you've made sure that the vet who you're dealing with is someone that you feel comfortable with again I know that if it's out of hours and you don't know them and you know there's all sorts of things but a lot of the, there are vets that come to your house that do out of hours as well so perhaps sort of get to know the person and that might make you feel better then because you know you know you know them and you know that how they work um, and I think that might be you know quite helpful for some some people um Isabel said I signed the consent form the vet told me that she was going to inject the drug and then he would go into a coma his heart might not stop and then she would need to give a second injection but he wouldn't be aware she left me in a darkened room with him and he curled right round after the injection and I cuddled and kissed him the vet came back in about five minutes she said his heart was very slow and he wasn't suffering so she gave the second injection she told me that his heart had stopped and then helped me put him to a natural sleeping position I put his toy next to him and then took him home. I think, yeah, and it's all, the, the whole process, I think is very important. Um, Emma said, we had a lovely telephone call from the vet after our cat baby was put to sleep and a lovely card from the vet showing, following our dog Tilly being put to sleep. She even made reference to a photograph we'd shown her. It's, it's little things like that, I think, just know that you're being listened to and that the vet has genuinely, you know, because it, it is really hard. I find euthanasia hard in terms of, you know, I just find obviously it's just really sad. Nobody wants, even if I have only first met the pet, I find it really hard because I think the whole thing is, it is really sad because you know, you know how, I know how it feels. Um, and I often, if, you know, will go home after a shift. It might even be a dog or a cat, a rabbit, a guinea pig, something I didn't even know. And I'll still get really upset in the car on the way back. Some of your vets may well, cry with you and you know you will get quite teary as well and I think that's that's totally normal um you know it all depend on the person really that you're you're with I'm I'm a very emotional person so I always try and sort of try not to you know do get you know try not to show all my emotion um when it's somebody else that's having the hard time and usually you know do it on the way home when no one's around um Vicky said do you have to have a catheter put in for the final injection can they not just have the injection our catheter went wrong at an already stressful time so the catheter um the the so the benefits of having that put in is usually couple of things really is that first of all you don't have to have anybody else holding the pet to raise the vein so you know you haven't got to be kind of <clears throat> and your vet is almost I'm usually more relaxed because they know that they've got that IV line in and having to get a vein in front of an owner in a situation where you want it to be as perfect you know it has to be good it has to be you know this is this is what they're going to remember the most um you know, sometimes as well, that, that means that then if that goes wrong and, and you, you, you've only really got two really great veins and if you struggle with one and that doesn't go well, you've only got the other one. And I think then that can make almost give a, a kind of a stressful environment. You don't have to have the catheter put in. Um, you don't. You can you can ask and, and not have that done. Normally, it's a smoother situation. Obviously, in your situation, it was not. Um, and that's really sad because you just say it's sort of put in and it doesn't and then it's there and, and it's a bit nicer for everybody really a bit more relaxed and, and then once it's there you can have as long as you want rather than kind of you know and if you sort of say oh, I'm not ready yet it's not like you've got someone going away and coming back going away coming back it's just it's there and it's, it's all ready to go um, I think that the vet said that the first injection was into the liver and finally into the heart yeah so sometimes um especially with cats you know sometimes they'll the injections might go and it all depends if, a, if a animal doesn't have a very good um like very strong vessels then it might be the injection does go somewhere else you're right 
Um, I know, Emily, I knew that in Poland, you probably wouldn't have that option that you can make the decision for an animal to be put to sleep against the, the, you know, anyone else's will. Uh, let's have a little look. Um, Loretta, we were asked if we wanted an autopsy. We said, no, I really regret this and wish I had chosen to have this done to understand why she died. Yeah, that's a very good question that you've um, that you've sort of, or a very good point that you've made up there, like or brought up there, because actually, it's not it's not always commonplace actually to have a postmortem or an, or an autopsy. It's quite a specialist thing for some clinics. Some clinics will do that there and then, but some will actually send them away to have that done. And again, I think that if you really do want that done, then you know certainly have that conversation. Um, but it's not for everybody. And I think that you said no, and you said no at the time, because you obviously felt that it, it didn't feel right at the time. Maybe you just didn't want, want that. And, but obviously in hindsight or, or afterwards, we definitely think that maybe we would have chosen differently. Um, but I think you've got to go with what was happening at the time and you didn't. And I think that you shouldn't beat yourself up about that. Um, yes, Emily does amazing pet portraits. She's very, very, was, yeah, very lovely um, pictures. Natasha, hello Sophie, please could I, yes, you can privately message me, of course you can. If anyone one wants to do that, then um, you, you're very welcome to, you can't ask me anything privately. Yeah, Nikki's right, we are generally a bit rubbish about talking about these things with our human loved ones, let alone our pets, but as you say, a plan is so comforting, even if you change your mind about certain things at the time or afterwards, a plan just gives you something positive to focus on. Yes, it does, because straight after, you could almost have that empty feeling, but if you know that you've got that, maybe that piece of jewellery to look forward to or that getting those ashes back, maybe making that little shrine or making that little part of the garden that's theirs or a focus, I think, that you can take, you know, you've got something going on after that. It doesn't have to be they've gone and that's it. What do you think about that, Carrie? Do you think people should sort of make, you know, have that as a little focus for afterwards? Sorry, I've, I've, I lost, uh, I lost track of the... Of, where, of what I was saying. You are saying about like how, you know, it's quite a nice thing to sort of have a focus afterwards. So making that little like shrine or doing something. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. And basically like, that's why I think a plan is good so that you've got a focus afterwards. So it's not that you're just left empty with no pet there. You've actually got something that you think positive that you can make afterwards. Yeah, something to focus on. And I think also, it gives you a little bit of control back over a situation where you may feel as if you had little to no control over what happened or how quickly things happened. And this is something that you, you can do um, as like a sort of, I don't know, almost like a, a, a last um, outpouring of love to your companion. Um, it's something that you can, uh, you know, you, you can choose how it looks, what you add, um, make it, you know, just make it your way. And um, I think that in itself is quite therapeutic because yeah. you're, you know, you're doing something for your companion, even though they're, they're unfortunately no longer physically with us. You're doing something that is creating like a visual reminder to keep their memory alive, keep yeah. their story going. Um, I mean, my bookshelf, I've got my three, uh, three rats, their little caskets. I've also got, um, uh, we lost uh, a goldfish many years ago as well. And I've, I've even got his, um, his, his jug uh, that oh. we used to do water changes with and some of the gravel, uh, from his fish tank is at the bottom and that and so that's that my little sort of like tribute shelf um yeah. so other people might understand it but i said well this is this is my fish's jug and then we've got my, my boys um and then just little i've just got little trinkets on there that are personal to me that remind me of them and it does i mean some sort of shrine or uh, memorial corner or little plot in the garden it doesn't have to make sense to anybody else it, it, as long as it brings you comfort. Yeah, um, I agree. And you get, you know, yeah. 
And then there might be situations where you go completely opposite to that. So we had a little leather sofa that my spaniel used to sleep on. And when he went, the first thing my partner said to me was, I've, I've got to get it out of the house. It's got to go. I can't even walk past it. Um, so, you know, and, and he lit, you know, he sort of said, we, we've, we've got to take this chair out. I, I can't. It's making me so sad to even look at it now. We have it back in the house and, you know, we, he's kept, but it took probably a good year until he'd even look at this chair. Um, yeah. So I think everyone, again, is so different. For me, I'd, 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 I didn't, Mark, you know, actually I found, I sort of almost thought I could, you know, now, now we've got it back again. I almost think I can still see him lying there. And for me, that's quite comforting. For Adam, he just said, I, I can't look at that. So I do understand that everyone is really different. And you might think, no, I... I I don't, I don't want to have that, at, or, or I don't want to have that right now. You might change your mind, you know, weeks, months down the line. Um, oh, so a couple of more here. Julie's put, last year, my five-year-old boxer died suddenly as a result of a heart attack. She had been diagnosed with aortic stenosis when she was 18 months old. So we knew it was inevitable, but it was still a huge shock when it happened. I felt it was the most traumatic experience for me, but the best outcome for my dog, she near the end of a walk, which she enjoyed with her furry friends, much better than being put to sleep at the vets. You're right. And I think there's that fine line again. So your, your um, dog obviously, you know, she, um, went sort of quickly like that and almost to go on at the end of a walk is almost, you know, the, the perfect scenario. I didn't know anything about it. Horrible for you. But like you say, good outcome for your dog. But then I get a lot of people on the flip side that will say, do you think I should just leave them until they die at home? Um, and I think that if you are in any doubt, then never do that. I see some people that I think, please, please don't, because they're actually really struggling. And it, for some dogs, cats, rabbits, you know, it could be, I mean, mainly, mainly our dogs and cats, because the small animals tend to go a bit quicker. Um, they could be like that for weeks before they they finally go and I, I yeah no one wants that um let's see oh good okay that's good lots of people saying they found this really helpful which is good I know I've put a few links on here that um Carrie um suggested didn't you with some help with dealing with like you know with bereavement oh she gone Sorry, are you? Yeah, no, the links I just added on yeah. there. Yeah, um, they look quite helpful. Um, so the first one, the Ralph site, um, is run, it it was created by a, a, a fellow vet, um, Shailen Desai. I know Shailen. Yes, the Ralph is uh, Shailen's. I thought um, when I just saw the Ralph there, he's... Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, I know. I used to work quite near the Ralph, um, and he's oh. he's quite a soft Disney shale, and like he's always doing lots for all the animals. Yeah. So as far as I mean, I might be wrong, but as far as I'm, I'm aware, um, like the Ralph, like his hospital and the Ralph site was named after his cat Ralph, um, who was. when he passed, he was obviously understandably devastated, and and so like the Ralph site sort of came out of this, um, and it's a really good resource I think for pet owners because it has a list of pet bereavement counsellors up and down the country it has a uh, principal um, resources that you can just print off and read it in your own time and they also have a Facebook group um, the Ralph Pet Bereavement Support Group which is so sweet and comforting because what I personally love about that group is that no matter where people are on their own grief journeys, they rally around to support everyone and one another. There's none of this sort of like what I call sort of grief top trumps or one up and shit, like, oh well, mm -hmm. I'm going through worse because I've been through this. And there's none of that. It's it's literally you could have somebody that had just said goodbye to their pet and someone that had lost their pet many like months ago. Yeah. And yet everyone will, there's none of this, well, I feel worse than you. It's like, mm -hmm. I get where you're coming from. I've been there or I'm going through that now and let's just support one another. So that's very sweet. It's a, it's a really nice group. 
Yeah. Um, I'll check that out. The other two, um, so living with pet bereavement is um, Don Murray, who is a farmer, um, pet crematorium worker. Like she, uh, she's a pet bereavement counsellor and uh, a friend of mine. And she's been, um, I think she's been a bereavement counsellor for like 25 years, maybe more. Um, but she is actually who inspired me to start as well, um, as well as the work I was already doing. Um, but she's she's brilliant. She's got um, a Facebook group um, where she offers support to people. Um, she runs her own pet bereavement counselling service. And then um, the other one is the Scottish Pet Bereavement Counselling Service, which is run by Wendy Andrew. And she's, um, you, you, other people may have heard of her already. She's been on the radio a few times in the papers. Yeah. And um, she's lovely. She's, I think she's an ex-police officer. And she's, uh, she's a, I think she's a dog walker, uh, but she's a, also a pet bereavement counsellor. And uh, both Dawn and Wendy are very passionate about what they do and very supportive and very easy to talk to. Um, now, I do run a service, but due to uh, like personal health reasons, I've had to suspend it for the time being. But um, I just wanted to put these out there that, you know, um, especially the Ralph site, um, as I said, there's a list of pet bereavement counsellors uh, and their qualifications. So you can make your own choice of who you would like to go with. Um, obviously, there's also like the Blue Cross and the uh, Cats Protection uh, Pause to Listen service if you were looking for like free support. Um, I know Dawn doesn't, doesn't charge as far as I'm aware for her service. Um, That's amazing. But uh, I'm, you know, I mean, other people may do. Uh, I mean, I used to when I was running it, but I would like to say it was quite reasonable. But um, there are books out there that are very helpful as well. There's the, uh, one of my favourites is the Grief Recovery Handbook uh, for Pet Loss um, by, um, and I, can't, I think it's Russell Coleman. Um, I'm going to write that in the box because um, Coleman Friedman. And, um, yeah, if you, if you if you look at the um, the ham, um, handbook, it's um, I personally find it quite a good resource because who do you think it's books, by? Who did you say you think it's by, Carrie? Um, let's see, Friedman, Coleman, and James. Uh, the grief see. recovery handbook. Um, uh, grief recovery handbook for pets. Um, let me see. Recovery handbook. It's uh, there are some books out there that um, they just tell you what you already know. They're like, oh, you may be feeling like this, or expect to feel like this, or yeah. at this stage you may be feeling this way. Whereas this book actually tells you what to do with that like how to actually help yourself um with let's see oh, yeah that. here it is yeah um, just got it up here okay. yeah it. it looks really quite a nice little the grief recovery handbook for pet loss yeah yeah it's, um, it's it's got quite useful tips and strategies and um, as i've said other books they'll be like oh you go through you know like you may be experiencing depression numbness anger sadness um, bargaining acceptance and personally I feel that's all well and good like putting a name to how you're feeling but then they just sort of leave you to it it's like okay you're feeling this way and that and then there's no sort of strategies or coping uh, and tips um so that's why I like this particular book because it, it does have some good uh, ways of helping you navigate your grief and move forward yeah, yeah um yeah that looks like quite a nice book it's quite reasonable as well it's under 10 pounds it's actually quite a good little yeah. book I'm actually thinking I might um 
I might get that myself because it's quite useful, isn't it? Just especially when I'm working with a lot of people that lose pets. It's just quite a nice yeah. one. I might read through and see if it's a good one to, to share. Um, I've written a book um, for, well, it's actually for veterinary staff um, called The Last Visit, but it's under my um, old surname of Paul. So that's aimed at veterinary staff. Um, how and that's to, ball. ball. Yeah, so it'll be under carry ball. And that's called The Last Visit, oh, man, uh, which is, crazy. as I say, is aimed at veterinary staff because it discusses um, pretty much what you discussed earlier, um, how veterinary staff can make the experience as smooth as possible for the owners. And then I did write one for pet owners called The Other Side of the Table, We Grieve To, which um, the first couple of the chapters are dedicated to uh, real life experiences from veterinary staff um, and oh. them explaining how they feel yeah. and how they navigate how they navigate um, losses that they've experienced at work. Um, so like think, things like that. Um, but there are other books that aren't so much self-help but are just like easy to read. Like um, one of my favorites is uh, Megan's Journey by Janet Peel which is okay. can be construed as a more of a children's book however okay. I do feel it is suitable for all ages and what I like about it is uh, there's no hint of sort of um so there's no that sort of religious aspect to it because I think it's important that you can read something that can be read by any faith or any path and um it's just a lovely story. Um, what else? There's also Dodger Dog Says Goodbye by Karen G. And then there's uh, The Invisible Leash by Patrice Cast. These are really nice. I'm going to invest in some of these. Invisible Honestly, Leash. And yeah, actually, well, Megan's Journey, maybe that would be quite useful for children that are having to mm. cope with bereavement because, you know, haven't even mention them tonight and people do have children as well at home that yeah that are going to find it difficult I mean I I I let my children see Izzy they're four three and three well they actually my little girl was five yesterday so that's a lie she's now five she'd be very upset that I said four um and I let them see her body and um I suppose at the time it's quite an emotional thing to do, but now it's like today actually, they were sat outside because they know she's buried, that she's been buried. And one of my little boys turned around and went, Do you think Izzy might be crying in the hole because it's dark? And it was so innocent, but I was like, actually, it's very sweet. Like, you know, not everybody would maybe subject their children to that and maybe think it might, you know. Is it right? Is it wrong? Who knows? I don't, I don't know enough about child psychology, I guess, but you know, they seem to have taken it really well. They have they, they're desperate to tell everybody that they meet we used to have four dogs but Izzy died and she's buried in the garden and they, they need to but actually think maybe that's quite helpful for you don't know um but it's nice to know then that there is another little like Megan's journey that sounds good because I think something that might be more appealing to the younger like children that have, have maybe got to face it as well there's also a book um called Losing My Pet by Alex Lambert. And he was six while the book was written, I think. And uh, I think his mum is actually a veterinary surgeon and they wrote the book together. So that's actually from a child's point of view. That's sweet, uh, which that's is good. good. And these yeah. are good as well for those of you, because I know a few people on here work as pet professionals. So it's quite handy to have a little repertoire of maybe books or things that even you know that may be useful to to mention to other people you know that might help them too and because I, I did see lots of people say how they found this really useful and I'm glad because it doesn't get it doesn't get spoken about a lot I don't know do you know this site um Carrie and um, Stephanie said she's in a lovely supportive Facebook group for the uh, for the Silver Border Terriers we share stories and tips of our seniors celebrate their golden days but also support each other when they go over the rainbow bridge often people post a candle when 
they often place a candle when one had to go. I'm sure he, there are more groups like this. Yeah, I, do you know, I think it's almost the benefit now, isn't it, of the fact we have social media that we can sort of, uh, is it, it's a blessing and it's a, and it's not social media in some yeah. ways, but for situations like this, it is nice that people can um, share stories. And I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, sometimes I know that some people um, that are in these pet bereavement groups can find it quite triggering when they're at a later stage in their grief or bereavement. And then somebody who's freshly bereaved comes into the charts and if they share a similar story yeah. um, that it can be quite triggering um, and so I, I suppose you've just got to gauge whether um, the support you're receiving outweighs the potential for um, any unresolved feelings to come to yeah. the surface and, and whether you've got the support there yeah. um, but I mean generally speaking when I've spoken to people in the past, I've always suggested things like, um, like you said, you know, like talking to them, talking out loud. Um, I used to suggest uh, writing letters to them. Oh, that's uh, keep, keeping, uh, there was a lady I spoke to who um, said that um, she visited certain places with her pet together and she'd miss doing that. So I said, well, what about, visiting new places and writing about them, but detailing how you think your pet would have liked it or what, what they would have liked yeah. or what they wouldn't have liked. Um, and, you know, just keeping them involved somehow. Um, because it's about, um, we come to terms with not having them physically and visually here which I think as humans, as a very tactile species, I think we find difficult coping with the lack of physical and visual, um, you know, when they're here. But I think trying to keep them with us in some way that gives us comfort and helps us to um, to cope with their absence, their physical absence. Yeah. Um, so like the journaling, um, keeping a diary of just writing down thoughts and feelings can be very therapeutic. And um, yeah. even if you write something down and then decide to rip it up or bury it or just, you know, it, 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 that in itself can be quite therapeutic because it's it's the, you've got everything out and then you decide what, what you do with that, whether you keep the letter or you destroy it um you know but these sort of things are listed in the uh, grief recovery handbook as well um but to, just um i think the main thing is that when it comes to the feelings of the grief um the it's the intensity i think that takes people by surprise uh, and yeah. that they, they they're unprepared for the strength of their feelings and the unfortunately the only way is to face the pain head on because yeah. it isn't going away and it the more you ignore it the more it builds and it, it it needs a place to go i think when you face it head on sit with your feelings name your feelings acknowledge them then they lose some of their power and you can begin to work through them and I always say move forwards, not move on, because move on sort of says that you're leaving them behind. Yeah, and we're yeah, not. We're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you, you're not, you're rebuilding your life yeah. without them physically here, but they're here in heart and mind and in yeah. the, you know, the, in the whisker stuck down the side of the couch or nose prints on the window. Um, I was speaking of nose prints. Um, I heard somebody say that, that they couldn't bear to wash the windows because of the, the nose art and the poor art. And I loved that. Um, oh, and what yeah. they did is they, did, they got some sellotape or some sticky back plastic and were able to lift the prints that way. 
Um, I don't, I don't know how successful that that would be on a, you know, um, but I think it might, uh, it might be worth maybe considering. Um, yeah, such but, a nice thing yeah. to do. There's so many. I mean, it's and it's funny actually because you know you don't always think of all these things. And even like speaking with you tonight, Carrie, it's given me a few more ideas of how I can help people as well when I'm working in clinic because it is it, it is a really hard it's a really hard time and I think people you know and I think also if you've got pets yourself it's different but it's a bit like if you've got if you tell someone that a parent's died you people seem more understanding I suppose because more people have potentially left lost a person in their life rather than an animal and so then some for some people that perhaps don't have animals or mix them very much they don't always get that grief or understand or you know, I've heard it before when I've been around people, I don't know why she's so upset, you know, it's just a dog. And you're like, oh, I don't think you quite realise that, you know, for some people, they're more upset about their dog dying than a family member. And that's true. Yeah. You know, and that really yeah. does happen. So, oh, and Kat, oh, that's nice what Karen said here as well. And um, she's a groomer and help at a hydrotherapy unit. We have a memory tree. People can add a photo bauble when they lose their pet. And those that have said that... Um, thank you for us doing this tonight honestly it was the least I could do with how you all made me feel after I'd lost Izzy and I, I didn't a lot of the messages I couldn't even do reply to it just wasn't in the right frame of mind but I thought you know I think it's a good topic to talk about and I really hope in future to come up with a few more topics that we just don't you just don't talk about because they're just almost like you know the forgotten things that are the, probably the most important um a bit um yeah it definitely I'm, I'm I'm funny though I don't know about you Carrie when it comes to you know how you feel you deal with grief but I'm I'm quite a hider I'm quite like I'm quite good at hiding my emotions as I say on the outside not with other people like if other people you know if I have animals in the clinic and have to put them to sleep I can I can I can really feel that but it's funny with my own animals on the outside as I say I'm, I, I do hide how I feel I'm not very good at saying you know, like the other, when I, after Izzy had been, um, I put Izzy to sleep, I saw a friend who'd lost her dog about a month before and she was really crying over Izzy being put to sleep. And I was very shocked how I didn't, I mean, I'm, I'm a real crier person, but I didn't at all. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even, it was weird. I just sort of almost went cold to it and just went, yes. Almost felt like clinical. It was a very strange emotion, I thought. This is really weird. Like I'm, you know, at home, I'm just so emotional over this. But in front of people that I know, I must seem like I don't care. It was really odd. Yeah. Maybe we all do weird things, don't we, when we go through grief? Yeah, we do. Everyone's different, and I think um, again, it, it we shouldn't um, judge someone on the outward appearance and judge no. whether they're grieving because there's no right or wrong way to do this. And no. I think even if somebody doesn't seem to be upset and they seem to be coping okay, doesn't, you know, maybe they're just waiting for a safe space to let it out. And I um, I personally, uh, when I've lost my rats, I've been, um, I don't know, I suppose I, I feel a bit numb because uh, I know it has to be done and I'm going to lose them and I know it's for their good. And so I, I, I go ahead and I, you know, I do it. Um, and then afterwards I'll break, I'll break down once I've left the surgery. Um, yeah. And I have a 13 year old and a six year old. Um, my 13 year old, he's at the age where he's sort of, he understands and he's, he doesn't really let it out outwardly. Whereas my daughter, she, um, she seems okay at, this, at first and then, um like recently uh, we lost uh, one of our boys Fionn, um about three or four months ago and i thought mm. she was doing okay uh, but every now and again she'll burst into tears and she'll say mm -hmm. i'm really sad mommy and i'll mm -hmm. say why darling she'll say i miss my white rat and i said yeah. you know what i miss him too yeah and then i'll just let it let it out um but and I mean, even when I've spoken to to clients, um, there'll be those stories where I feel my throat tightened and my eyes are pricking a bit, and I'm like, 
I've really got to try to hold this together because, like, you know, it, it's bad enough for me hearing what this person's gone through, but for them to have experienced it, you know, um, yeah. But I mean, it, it's uh, everyone's everyone's different. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm a crier. Uh, my um, family members, uh, like my dad, he's, he hides it. He, he's very much. Um, I think I've seen him cry twice in my 40 years of living. Um, so every, everyone's different, but I think just because someone's grieving style doesn't match yours or or they seem to be, um, I don't know, some people may see someone that's upset and think, oh, they, they, you know, they're going over the top, they're being a bit dramatic. Or someone might look at somebody else and say, "How can they? How, how are they not crying? You know, yeah. why aren't they crying?" And it's like, well, both are both are doing okay. Both are doing yeah, dealing exactly. with it in their own way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. You're right. No, I think we've covered we've covered a lot of things tonight, Carrie. I think I, I'm hoping. I see lots of people said they found that helpful, and I'm sure you know the links there. And then Carrie. Um, if anybody does get want to get like in contact with you just for a question or so, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I think you've got my email address. Um, yeah, I have, and I'll um I'll just pop that through when I send the recording through tomorrow, just as a way of contacting Carrie if you want to ask or anything. And you know, those of you that um know me or or know through my site or my website, you're very welcome to ever you know, ask me anything. Um then that's yeah no problem at all but Carrie I'm so appreciative of you joining me tonight I really am like it's really kind of you to give up your time thank you thank you for having me no thank you and, and perhaps we could look at something working on something else in the future maybe working on some more framework and things to be able to help people um when they're dealing with this I'd love to work with you again it'd be very nice thank you thank you thanks everyone as well for for joining us and as I say, I'll get this recording over and even if you feel like it might help some other pet owners in your life or if you're working as a pet professional maybe some of the you know the other people that you come and you know come across then please do you know share it I'll probably pop it on my um on my website anyway as a, a sort of like a free thing to go in and share anyway if you feel you want to direct anyone to sort of you know skip through and pick out a few bits that might help them um Good. I'm glad it's really nice to, to see all the, the really positive comments. So I wish you all a very pleasant rest of your evening. And thanks again so much, Carrie, for, for joining me. Thank you. All right, have a lovely evening, everybody. All right. Night all. Night, Carrie. Good night. See you.